All right, good afternoon. Welcome to City and State's latest online discussion on the coronavirus pandemic. Our topic today is reopening the economy. I'm John Lentz, City and State's Editor-in-Chief. And before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors today. Thanks to a healthcare partner in this summit, Affinity Health Plan. With the unprecedented job loss due to the current health crisis, Affinity Health Plan is here as a resource to help educate the thousands of New Yorkers affected about the health coverage options available to them. Thank you to our sponsor, Jasmine Schlesinger LLP. They're one of Long Island's oldest and largest full service law firms. In light of the far reaching impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the firm launched a multidisciplinary coronavirus response team spearheaded by partner Jessica Baquette. Team members are dedicated to assisting clients in the public and private sectors with a myriad of legal and business issues arising from the current crisis. And finally, thank you to our sponsor. <clears throat> For the last 15 years, they have successfully represented Fortune 500 companies, advocacy groups, educational and cultural institutions, labor unions, and candidates for public office. On behalf of these clients, they've tackled complex public policy issues, won difficult political campaigns, and built powerful statewide coalitions. On that, turn it over to Evan Stavisky, a partner at the Parkside Group, who will make a few remarks and introduce our panelists. Evan, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for participating. You know, one of the defining movies of my earlier years was Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and there's a famous line in it where he says, the world moves pretty fast. And if you think about the fact that it's really been less than 90 days that the state's been shut down, and in that time, 25,000 New Yorkers have been lost, as you know, we've seen the daily totals. Uh, as the governor's shown national leadership, sharing real information with people every day. You know, we've seen 1.7 million jobs lost. Um, we began to see a reopening and a return to normalcy. And then obviously over the course of the last week to 10 days, the um, killing of George Floyd reminded all of us that the problems of the world didn't stop just because we were shut down for a pandemic. So I really wanna thank John, Tom Allen and the team at City and State uh, for hosting uh, this discussion because it really couldn't be at a better time. You know, as New York City's just entered phase one, as the suburbs have now entered phase two, I think fully as of tomorrow, and as upstate begins to look at phase three, you know, where do we go from here is I think on the top of everyone's mind. You know, my firm has been successful in helping companies navigate these challenges, uh, whether it was the shutdown or now the restart. But you know, there's a lot of questions that I think everyone has. And so to answer those questions, we have a great group of panelists, beginning with the Lieutenant Governor of New York State, former Hamburg Town Board member, former uh, uh, Erie County Clerk, former member of Congress, and uh, the widely respected and beloved uh, Lieutenant Governor of New York State, Kathy Hochul. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Tom Swazi, member of Congress, uh, whose district stretches from Northport all the way to the neighborhood where I grew up in Queens. Tom's unique in that he's both an accountant and uh, an attorney. He was um, obviously a uh, Nassau County executive for many years, one of the architects of the state's property tax cap program. And most importantly, he uh, was originally the mayor of his hometown of Glen Cove, New York. And you've never seen a local elected official, unless you've gone to the St. Rocco Street Fair in Glen Cove <laughs> with Tom Swazi, as uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to do. And then finally, uh, Jessica Baquette uh, from, Jasmine's, who, from Jasmine Schlesinger, who, as John mentioned, uh, is overseeing a multidisciplinary practice group at the firm. Uh, traditionally, she's done complex commercial disputes, labor and employment matters, and appellate work. But uh, smart law firms are adapting to this new normal and helping companies uh, adapt uh, to the challenges faced by COVID as a firms like mine. And so great to have Jessica join us as well. So John, I'll turn it back over to you to get things going. Great, thank you so much, Evan, appreciate it. And welcome from myself to all the panelists. Uh, one last point before we get started uh, for the audience. There are a few functions on Zoom. I'll point out, uh, if you wanna ask a question, we may have some time at the end to take some audience questions please do click that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do have a chat room as well. Uh, again, try to get those questions into the Q&A and not in the chat. Uh, but uh, if you want to chat, uh, you can use that function as well. Just use that drop down box. Uh, you can share comments with all the <coughs> not just the panelists. Uh, and please do keep it civil and on point in the chat room. 
You can also change the view settings on the top right hand corner of your screen. And now back to our panelists. Uh, as Evan noted, it is a very timely topic. Uh, just in this week in New York City, uh, there was a first stage of reopening that went forward, obviously different uh, levels in other parts of the state. Just wanted to ask broadly, where are we at uh, and how is it going? And uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, obviously the Cuomo administration has been at the forefront of a lot of this. Uh, let's start with you. Well, thank you, John, and to everyone at City and State and Tom Allen for uh, hosting this and allowing us this opportunity to engage directly with the people that are participating today because they have many questions. Also want to thank uh, Tom Swazi, former colleague in Congress, as well as uh, Jessica and Evan for uh, being supporters of today's event as well. So where are we at? We're in a far better place that anyone could have predicted 100 days ago. And I, and I love Evan's quote from Ferris Bueller's Day Off because that's one of my favorite movies as well, uh, to think about how far we've come in that time. And it's been long, it's been agonizing, painful, but my gosh, who would have thought that we'd be talking about reopening New York City as early as yesterday. And again, I know it's not everything, but we're in a far better place than we could have expected because we've been able to drive down the numbers. Uh, the governor's been incredible every single day showing transparency in government letting the people know exactly what he knows when he knows it and it's been building that trust that allowed us to get the support of new yorkers to do things like stay home not see your mom on mother's day to miss significant religious holidays to lose your job possibly lose your business this has been really tough on new yorkers but we're coming out of it and yesterday knowing that in this region nearly 600,000 people, 400,000 400, in the New York City area alone, but 600 in the suburbs as well, are finally getting back to work on incredibly clean subways. They are disinfected. I'm not saying you can eat off the floor, but uh, it's, it's uh, the governor attested with his ride yesterday that they are really good and, and it's looking much better. So we've made great progress, but I'll be the first to say we have a long way to go. And that's the next phase perhaps of our questioning here about what that next is new phase is going to look like and the post-pandemic era for New York State when we reimagine and reinvent ourselves again because we'll have no choice. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Congressman, I want to go over to you. Uh, again, as I noted, a lot of this is being driven at the state level. I wanted to get your perspective both at the federal level, kind of what Washington's doing here, but also as a former local elected official, what you're seeing uh, in Queens out on Long Island. Okay, thanks, John. Thanks for having me on. I'm so happy to join with the Lieutenant Governor. She's such a great public official. I can't imagine how hard that woman works, always traveling, always moving, doing such a great job, uh, working with our great governor, who's doing a fantastic job as well. And Jessica, it's nice to join you. And Evan Stavitsky, I, I, I don't think we're going to have the St. Rocco's Feast this year, so I don't know if I can get you out for a sausage and pepper hero this year, but uh, it's very good to join all of you. I think that... Uh, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety that remains. Some people are anxious about reopening. They're anxious about uh, the impact on coronavirus spread from the protests that we've all been a uh, part of. Uh, and other people are anxious to reopen. They're like, hey, come on, let's go. We got to move, move, move. So it's, you know, it's anxious about reopening and anxious to reopen. It's two, two different emotions that are driving people right now. Uh, we've been through so much, you know, worry about our health. Imagine how bad it was six weeks ago. We actually buried my father-in-law six weeks ago. He was 92 years old. He got the coronavirus, passed away within 36 hours. My mother-in-law got it, and uh, thank God she didn't get any symptoms. But we're so much better today than we were during those very dark times. It's, it's, it's amazing how far we've come because, as the governor often points out, because of the work that New Yorkers have done to flatten the curve. Uh, so from a federal perspective, you know, my number one priority is we have to get money to New York. That's my biggest number one priority. Got a lot of things I'm working on, but number one is we have to get money to the state. And when we first handed out money for hospitals, there was a $100 billion fund, $30 billion went out from the Health and Human Services uh, Department. And more money went to hospitals in Texas, which at the time had 2.5% of the cases, than went to New York which at the time had over 35% of the cases. So we said, hey, that doesn't make any sense. What the heck's going on here? So we fought and got, got every Democrat, every Republican in New York State to sign a letter. Can you for a little bit, Con? you. Okay. 
Yeah, I think you hit mute now. Um, we'll give you a second, uh, come back to you in a moment. Uh, Jessica, over to you. You know, we've, we've heard from two elected officials. If you could uh, give your perspective from the private sector on, on how this is going forward and the challenges you see. Good afternoon, and it's a real honor to be presenting on a panel. With Can you hear me now? And we hear you now, can't see you, Congressman. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I must have some sort of technical glitch. I apologize. Okay, sorry, just so, to cut you off there. We'll get back to you momentarily. And Congressman, back to you. Okay, so sorry about that. I had a technical glitch. Uh, you know, so we're, we've been through so much already, uh, and we're so much better now than we were, as the governor has pointed out so many times. We have our mojo back, and I feel that. I see that wherever I go. Uh, people are much more uh, confident than they were before. But we can't fall back into a situation where we see a spike again. If we do, then the stock market real, will really crash. Uh, if we spike again, then people will lose confidence in their government. They will lose confidence in each other. So testing, tracing, isolation, all so essential to us as we move forward. And getting, uh, getting back to where I was, I don't know how much I got cut off from, we got the money for the New York City hospitals. Now we have a special fund to try and get money in the HEROES Act that the Democrats passed to states based upon the rate of infection. I got every Democrat and every Republican in New York and New Jersey, and then we built coalitions throughout the country with other states that were hard hit, to say that this special fund, we got it up to $49 billion, would go to those states that were hardest hit. Of that $49 billion, New York will get about $10 billion of that money alone. That combined with the other money will bring in about $20 billion to New York State if we get this deal done. The New York delegation, Democrats and Republicans, are aligned. Everybody wants to negotiate the HEROES Act. They don't like certain things in the $3 trillion bill. It won't be $3 trillion when it's said and done, I'm sure of that. But one thing that we will not negotiate on is how much money comes to New York State. So that's a big fight we have ahead. Uh, that, along with you know, the SALT deduction, we're trying to get, reinstate that. It's in the HEROES bill. I don't know if it'll make it to the final deal. It's a big priority of mine as well, and money for state and local governments. So I've talked for too much, including my technical glitch, so I'll come back again later. Sure, thank you, Congressman. And, and my condolences on, on behalf of your father-in-law, I think I speak thank for Thank you, John, time. thank you so much. Um, and, and we'll get back to the, the federal funding thing in a little bit down, down the road here in the discussion, but uh, Jessica, sorry, back to you uh, on what you're seeing. Thanks. It's a real honor to be speaking on a panel with Lieutenant Governor Hochul. Uh, Congressman Swazi and a brilliant strategist like Evan Stavitsky. So nice to see you all. So one thing that's really amazing is I feel like we're really seeing the resilience of New York business owners, sort of following the Wayne Gretzky saying of skating to where the puck is going. We're seeing people who are finding the need and filling it, doing new things with their businesses and really trying to stay afloat during this very difficult time. You're seeing creativity in the way that <clears throat> people are uh, delivering the services that they ordinarily deliver. And you're seeing a lot of businesses really dedicated to complying with what amounts to a ton of new laws. Executive orders, there's a new one every day. Um, we have help at the federal, state, and local levels. And as a lawyer, a lot of my clients are reaching out to me constantly trying to figure out how best can I run my business in compliance with all of these uh, new requirements? How best can I take advantage of the relief that's available to me? And you see the Bar Association, both the New York State Bar Association, the local bar associations are offering a lot of pro bono services to these businesses, which I think is essential because in order to comply with a lot of the reopening requirements, there's, there's a cost, there's a regulatory cost to businesses. And so the last thing a lot of businesses need you know, our legal fees. And so it's really admirable what the Bar Association is doing um, in helping counsel businesses about how to take advantage of the relief that's available and also how to comply with all these new regulatory burdens. Sure, thank you, Jessica. Um, back to you, Congressman, I did wanna follow up on just this week, uh, it was officially designated that we are in a recession that started in February, 2020. Uh, and yet, uh, as the Times reported, Quote, most economists expect this recession to be both particularly deep and exceptionally short, perhaps just a few months, as states reopen and economic activity resumes. Uh, you've seen the market going, you know, up and down. Um, 
but but there have been some positive signs on the economic front. Is is there a risk that um, you know Republicans, uh, the Trump administration, will see this and say, look, we don't need to pass legislation, we don't need to bail out uh, states like New York? Um, what what is the mood in Washington? What are you hearing? Uh, what do you think the likelihood is that a deal gets done? Well, first of all. It's the height of hypocrisy for someone like Mitch McConnell to say that uh, we don't want to bail out the blue states. We don't want to bail out New York. New York bails out uh, Kentucky, his state, and other states throughout the country every single year. And we're happy to do it because we're New Yorkers. But the reality is, is that in the past five years, New York has sent $120 billion more to the federal government than we've received back in federal aid, federal services, federal contracts. $120 billion more. Kentucky, Mitch McConnell's state, has received $150 billion more than they've put in. So it's the height of hypocrisy to suggest we're being bailed out. New York State is the epicenter of the coronavirus crisis. I represent three of the six hardest hit counties in the United States. We need help right now. We need to make up not only for the money we've spent, but for the lost revenues that we've been hit with so hard uh, because of the shutdown of the economy. And it, it's, it's, this is what the federal government's role is. If the federal government can make one mistake right now, it's not spending enough. Every economist has said that, that it's essential that uh, we spend the money now. You, you can't make a mistake by spending too much right now. Now, will that be a problem we have to figure out six months from now, a year from now, as we start to figure out how to, how to get ourselves back in balance? Yes, it will be. But right now, we have to do everything we can that we've been doing already to help our hospitals and frontline workers, to improve with testing, to look for a vaccine, to do the unemployment checks, to do the stimulus checks, to do the small business PPP program. But now we really have to help the states and the local governments that have all the frontline workers that have been suffering throughout this process doing the essential work that we have. You know, people talk of the cops, the uh, uh, Republicans are saying, we don't want to defund police. We don't want to defund police. Well, you're defunding police if you don't give money to New York State and to our state and local governments throughout the country. That's what you're doing. You're defunding, defunding the police. So we need to get money back to New York, and we need it back now. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure because there's a lot of Democratic and Republican governors, county executives, town supervisors, and mayors, and council members, and legislators throughout the country, Republicans and Democrats, that are clamoring for this essential help because they're all hit, even if they had a lower incidence of cases, which everybody did lower than New York, they still got hit by the shutdown of the economy. So these states, these cities, these villages, these towns, they all need, these counties, they all need the help right now. So we just need to put the pressure on them. And uh, they're going to play games and they're going to do what they typically do. And there'll be some horse trading. But, you know, this is what we are here for. This is why we've got to fight for New York. Sure. Um, and I did want to touch on as well uh, the level of coordination. Obviously, there's, there's been uh, some differences of opinion between the governor and the president on, on moving forward on things uh, over the past weeks and months. Um, there's been efforts by different states, New York partnering with other states in the region uh, to get on the same page, uh, looking at different regions within the state. Uh, how well is that coordination working on a you know, county to county level, state to state level, state to federal level? Uh, and Lieutenant Governor, let's start with you. Well, thank you. I first of all, I'll address the local level. What the governor did just you know, a couple months ago when we realized we are going to have to have a, a strategy for reopening that covers the entire state. And, and it was very enlightened to say that we won't wait till New York City is in a good place with the numbers, the metrics, hospitalizations down, and hold back the rest of the state. So I've been asked to be responsible for the upstate response, particularly Western New York, the second largest city in New York is Buffalo, my hometown. So I have been involved in day-to-day -day conversations, literally with all the county leaders from our region. We have a doctor, the dean of the UB Medical School, on the calls, watching the numbers closely. So when there's a concern, if a county says, I need more testing kits, I need to have, I have a spike in a nursing home, I need to have more help with contact tracing, that daily call is our early warning system to say to Albany, the counties need help. And that's happening all over. So I would say that the relationships are very good at the county level. Now you talk about the state and federal level, I think the Congressman uh, was very clear in our shortcomings and the fact that the governor has literally gone to Washington and said to the president, you, know, you can't suppress the New York state economy because you'll be holding back the American economy. Nothing's gonna happen good unless we start bringing back 
the job creators in New York City and the surrounds. And so he's made that case. He's talked about getting money for major infrastructure projects that we believe will be important to bringing back the economy overall. Uh, let's we can do with Penn Station. Let's finish that. LaGuardia, uh, in, you know, the Second Avenue subway, taking that further up. We have a lot of jobs that can be created, but we need the federal government's okay, even for congestion pricing. I mean, we are held hostage to so many decisions that have to come from the federal government. So yes, the governor has said, when we've needed a ship to come in, we've needed assistance with the Javits Center. Um, we, he gives credit where credit is due in those regards. But when it comes to real money and a real difference, I'm sorry, you know, we do not have anywhere near what we need in the state of New York. And you talk about the numbers, the first major wave of funding going to airlines and to big corporations that didn't need it instead of down to the smallest businesses that are desperately hanging on, that was wrong. As well as the fact that New York State, when you think about this is appalling, the per COVID case, New York State received $24,000 per COVID case. Montana received over $2 million per case, Alaska about $3 million. There's just no equity here. This is a national crisis, a, a national disaster, federal disaster. And we should have had 50 states not competing with each other for PPE and for supplies that were desperately needed to keep alive. There should have been a federal response. So, so in that front, John, I, I can't say I'd give an A plus on, on the federal response. It's been spotty, but they can really deliver for us now to do exactly what Tom Swazi's talking about. Everybody get together, help us out. It is not a bailout. It is finally giving us what we deserve because of how much we have spent to send to Washington, something I've been talking about since I was a staffer with Senator Moynihan, who brought this to light a long time ago. Sure, a follow up there, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, the governor also set up these regional control rooms. Um, it's a little unclear whether they're primarily advisory or if they have any uh, authority. There, there have been some criticisms, I think, in the Buffalo News at the end of May. Uh, they said, quote, the governor's surprise announcement that each of the state's 10 regions would have to clear an extra hurdle before entering the planned second phase exposed to reality some observers had already suspected. Local and regional leaders have only nominal influence in reopening the state. Uh, and any reaction to that? Well, what kind of role do local officials, as you once were yourself, uh, what kind of role do local officials have? Right. I'm a former county official. I'm a former town official. So I'm always sensitive when people think that the state is not cooperating. The state is cooperating here. Uh, that is why we get together literally every single day and say, what's happening here? What concerns do you have? How can we help? What do you need? And that relationship wasn't there before this. I mean, it was there in some sense, but for you know counties and most rural areas to have direct access to myself every single day, to be able to tell us what their concerns are. So I don't agree with the premise that it's not working. We knew that Albany was be making sure that what we do is right. And I'm not an expert to look at those numbers that are coming in every day. The governor decided to bring in not just state and national experts, but international experts. Because John, we have one chance to get this right. We do it too early, more people land in the hospital, more people die. We do it too late, we've suppressed the economy far too long. It has been a, an incredibly delicate balance and going by the metrics and the facts and the data, the governor has gotten it right so far and doing an incredible job. And that's what the control rooms are all about. Not to say yes or no, because there's political pressure locally or one area, one county executive says, I'm ready to open, I'm ready to go get my hair cut. I wanna go eat a hot dog indoors. That doesn't matter. That's not dealing in the reality. And we have to get it right, particularly we're talking about a place like New York City that was so knocked on its feet, or knocked off its feet. It was incredible what this community had to endure. And to bring back our state, we're gonna do it smart. And the control rooms have played an important role in making sure that the concerns and the data coming from Albany, telling people what you have to do to reopen, uh, giving intelligence to the business community, saying now phase three is out. If I'm in New York City, I'm looking at phase one, but I have a restaurant, I'm now following the phase three guidelines, so I'm ready and ready to roll as soon as I'm able to. Sure. And I, John, I just want to just piggyback on that. I mean, I think the state has done an awesome job. You can't have every lo local municipality making these decisions. They don't not, some of them have the capacity, but a lot of them don't have the capacity to do all the data-driven decisions that this administration has done with the governor's leadership with the help of the lieutenant governor. It's really amazing what they've done. And it's such a contrast to what's happened at the federal level, which has not been data-driven. And you know, it's so different from place to place, from region to region, not only within our state, 
but throughout the country. I hear my colleagues, you know, when I'm down in Washington, D.C., and you know, it's like, oh, well, I'm enjoying my time out in the country, and, you know, this is a great time for me to spend time with my family, and, you know, why don't you, you know, you guys should have tried herd, immu herd immunity or something like that in New York. I said, are you kidding me? I said, six weeks ago, we had people dying, people worried they couldn't get a ventilator for their family members when they went to the hospital. We had refrigerator trucks with bodies piled up. We had people on long lines when it was cold outside, it was raining outside, they're coughing on each other just because they're so desperate to get tested. So I think the way that the state of New York has handled this has been a model for others to follow for the long term because they've used data, they've used experts, they've done it by region, they've recognized the differences by region, and they've gotten people to coordinate with each other. And everybody's getting a chance to give input. That's the most important thing. But the guidance coming from the state has been, I think, fantastic. Sure, and it does seem like there have been signs that uh, at times uh, the Coleman administration is responsive to concerns. Uh, I did want to raise at least one um, issue that's come up lately, malls. Should malls be allowed uh, to reopen sooner? This has come up on Long Island, come up in the Hudson Valley. I believe uh, Nessa County Executive Laura Curran said she's afraid that leaving malls closed until phase four uh, could really hurt the economy. Uh, she said, quote, uh, retailers, and the people they employ have been devastated by three months of economic shutdown, by delaying the reopening of malls by an additional month or perhaps even longer. I'm afraid that some may never reopen at all, and I shudder to think what the impact on our economy would be. Uh, any reaction to that uh, specific concern? I think that one of the concerns there is taking into account the differences between, for example, the downstate counties, uh, Westchester County, and then New York City and some of the upstate counties. You know, there are some towns on Long Island that have a nice Main Street strip with stores, but, you know, by and large, a lot of our shopping is done inside of malls. It's just sort of the nature of what goes on in this region. So the fact that a store might be able to reopen if it's freestanding somewhere, but because it's in a mall on Long Island, it can't reopen is problematic. But on the other hand, you have a crowd control problem because people go to the mall and some of them aren't there to shop. Some of them there are there to hang out or socialize or do whatever. And so if you can strike some sort of a balance between that crowd control problem and the need to reopen these businesses, I think it's something that should be considered. And I would say- yeah, I can go first. Yeah, these are on the consideration, absolutely. And this is the kind of feedback that we're getting Again, the governor has been very flexible when the data supports the decision to do something earlier. For example, uh, in phase two, which New York City will be looking at uh, before long, so get ready for this. You know, outdoor dining was supposed to be part of all restaurants in phase three, and the governor just announced that that would be allowed in phase two. Uh, same thing with gathering in uh, for religious services. There's now a 25% capacity requirement as for uh, an activity, religious events that were going to be held off till a later phase. We didn't even know for sure when that would be. So the governor is very good at processing the information, uh, really weighing the risk and the reward. Uh, the first thought was that a lot of businesses and malls can have a separate entrance, so you won't have the congregation that Jessica is referring to. That's what our concern is. This is where a lot of people go to hang out. Now, if you're hanging out outside, we know that it's much safer to be outdoors than in a confined setting. And so uh, I think that's the flexibility that we've shown. I don't have an answer on the ship, but the, the administration really has been listening and not just, you know, doctrinaire if there's not justification based on the facts. You know, I think that flexibility is what's so important here and learning from data as we go forward. People are worried right now from the, the, the close contact people have had during the protests, whether we're going to see a spike or not. That's why testing is so important. Contact tracers are so important. And if you look at the phasing, which again, I think was so well done, the first phase is for businesses where you just have to worry about your employees, manufacturing, construction, just we, look, make sure you have procedures and processes for your employees. Phase two is for those businesses that have limited interaction or by appointment only interaction for the most part uh, with the outside public. So it's just a few people. Phase three, you're talking about dealing with a lot more people and phase four, really an enormous amount of people. So we have to figure out and learn from each step as we go along. I think flexibility is very important. I think that the idea of maybe being flexible with that two week period between each phase is really, really important. Uh, and I think that we have to learn from the data going forward. That's so important that we get data as quickly as possible. As I said in the very beginning, some people are anxious about reopening, other people are anxious to reopen. 
with, you know, two different me meanings to their anxiety. So we have to take that into account. People are really, you know, Laura Curran, fantastic job she's doing in this process, a former job that I held, county executive. She wants to get the businesses moving. She's hearing it from her businesses every day. And she needs the sales tax revenues. There's no question about that. Hopefully, if we get the money from the federal government to the state and to the counties and to the other local governments, we won't have that same type of pressure at the government level. But at the business level, people's whole livelihood is on the line. Whether you're an employee who's not working every day or whether you are a business owner, a small business owner, put their whole life into building a business and now it's on hold, you're freaking out. That you're, everything you've, you've built is, is, is at risk right now. So we have to deal with that anxiety by talking about it as much as possible, being flexible and using data. And, and you alluded to um, uh, the protests. And is there any planning now that there might be a, a, an unexpected spike in cases uh, because of all these protests uh, that, that have been taking place in New York City and other parts of the state? This is something we're legitimately concerned about, yes. And that's why we've opened additional testing sites and encouraged everyone who participated in a protest. I know people, you know, younger people looking at the numbers saying, well, it's mostly older people. You're going back to a home where you're living with your parents, you might see your grandparents, you may be asymptomatic and be a carrier for a number of days before you show any, any sign at all that you have it. So that's why we've been uh, smart. A lot of the protesters uh, have been wearing the mask. We wish 100% would, but many have been very thoughtful about this, uh, trying to keep their distance whenever possible. But uh, there are tests out there now available in many places in New York City where people we think would have been protesting. And so I encourage everyone uh, to take advantage of that. And we'll watch those numbers. We'll absolutely monitor. Again, we thought that there'd be a spike after people went to the beaches Memorial Day. We sounded the alarm, like, maybe you shouldn't go. Maybe you should, you know, we're going to stagger how many people, how many cars in the parking lots. Uh, do you really need to go this year? Wear a mask, socially distance. And we watch the numbers closely. We now have the benefit of time of saying, no, there was not a spike uh, in any particular area that was apparently not a super spreader in any one of those areas. And we feel comfortable going forward. So we're going to keep always taking a step, you know, sending out the warning, uh, asking people to be really smart and then evaluating the data. And that's why there, that two week period has been working thus far. But again, the numbers are extraordinarily impressive compared to where we were just a few short months ago. And so uh, again, this administration has been always looking at the data and the reality. And I say there's no, no two people who want to get New York State rocking and rolling again, fired up and get our economic engine going and Governor Cuomo and myself, because I chair all the regional economic development councils. I have been speaking through Zoom calls to more business leaders, small business, large business, and they're desperate to get back, but they know, and you heard the Congressman mention the word confidence, and Jessica referred to this as well. If we don't have the confidence of the public to know that they're going to be safe when they finally come out of their homes and emerge from all these sacrifices they've had to address, then no, no one's gonna walk into a business. No one's gonna support your restaurant. No one's gonna be there for your little retail shop that you work so hard to build. So they have to believe in us that we're going to get it right. And this is the tension that's out there, but so far we've been really good at managing this. And Jessica, I know you yeah, Congressman first. Sure. I just wanna say there's three types of testing that we have to look, be very concerned about. We have to test people that are symptomatic, obviously. Those are the people that are most obvious we need to look at. But we really need to look at people that are asymptomatic that have been exposed to the coronavirus. That's so important. Asymptomatic people, people that are not coughing, they don't have the headache, they haven't lost their sense of smell, but they have the disease. And those folks are the biggest spreaders of all. Very big concern about the young people that the Lieutenant Governor was referring. So we have to test people that are asymptomatic, especially if they've been exposed to somebody who uh, did have the coronavirus already. And third, we have to test people that have been sick already to see if they have the antibodies. Now, that's not a guarantee of immunity, but it's less likely that you'll get sick if you have the antibodies. That's why widespread testing is so important. The president, the administration has failed. They should have done exactly what the Lieutenant Governor was referring to earlier related to the PPE and the ventilators where the, the federal government should be purchasing, I believe, and I proposed this to the administration. I actually wrote a memo on it. I've, I've been trying to spread it around, they're not listening. We should be doing a million tests a day and they should be purchased by the federal government. 500,000 tests, half for people that are symptomatic, half for people that are asymptomatic, and another half million tests a day for people to look for antibodies. A million tests a day, every day for the next year, that would cost $30 billion, which is, it sounds like a big number, but it would give people the confidence that they would be safe for them to go back because we have the data. 
And with that, we should be hiring 200,000 contact tracers all over America. Again, I think the federal government should be doing it. 200,000 people cost $50,000 a piece in total between their salaries and benefits. Get uh, young people, recent graduates, get Peace Corps and Army, uh, uh, AmeriCorps and other people that want to do community service, cost $10 billion. And then another $10 billion for 200,000 hotel rooms throughout the country. So the people who can't isolate in their homes could actually isolate in a hotel room and it would actually provide a boost to the hotel industry that they need right now and also help us to help people isolate. That would be another 10 billion. $50 billion to plan to reopen America. It would give people the confidence that it's safe to go back out into the world. Because we can do everything we want. We can do phase one, phase two, phase three. If people are scared, they're not gonna go to the restaurant. They're not gonna go shopping. They're not gonna feel good about going back to taking the train, taking the, the subway. So we have to give people that sense of confidence. And Jessica, I know you're paying attention to the protocols employers have to put in place and, and the compliance question. Anything to add? You know, the one thing that I would say is there's, I mentioned it before, there's a cost. There's a cost to compliance. Um, and I know that Nassau County has given out a thousand PPE kits to small businesses. And a lot of these businesses that haven't been able to do really any business in the last several weeks and months you know, are struggling with all costs, especially the cost to actually come into compliance to have sufficient uh, masks, hand sanitizer, to, you know, only have a certain number of uh, customers coming back into the space, social distancing markers, all of that. And so, you know, one thing that I would love to see for the PPP money, you can use the PPP money on other things besides payroll, we know including utilities, if the PPP money could be used for the cost of compliance with mandatory regulations for reopening, I think that would go a really, really long way with those small businesses that look at those costs. They might be minor costs to some businesses, but to the, the smallest businesses, those costs are a real big burden, although it's a necessary burden because once we all go back out into the world, people are going to get sick. It's going to happen. We hope it will be minimal. And the more we comply and the better we do, the fewer people will get sick. But businesses have to be able to afford to come into compliance. So to the extent that counties and state governments can do something to help uh, facilitate the payment of those expenses. And on the federal level, we already have this mechanism in place. We have these PPP loans. There's money left in the program. People are still acquiring those loans. And you've seen that the PPP program has been tweaked um, repeatedly. And I think this is a tweak where we could make a real difference in helping ease the burden of coming into compliance, especially because compliance is so important to continuing to keep that curve flat. Sure. Following up on that, um, you know, we've discussed wearing masks, uh, social distancing, temperature checks, things like that. Um, so is there any enforcement mechanism? You know, you saw early on uh, some, some police behavior that was criticized uh, in, in terms of how certain social uh, distancing measures were enforced. Um, do we need some kind of enforcement mechanism? Do you just trust New Yorkers to be good actors? How do, how do we grapple with that? Well, there is a lot of trust involved, but every single business in New York uh, should be looking at forward.ny.gov, look at your industry, look it up, find out what the protocols are required for you to reopen. And this is another advantage of New York City uh, going after parts of upstate that have already opened in phase one and phase two and approaching phase three. All the guidance is already out there. The, the early one, you know, we were waiting for guidance that would come out just shortly beforehand because we needed to have the flexibility in case we had a setback. And so there is a lot of very detailed information of what our expectations are, but here's where we are aligned. The state government is not just arbitrarily imposing requirements. These are aligned with the public health interests as well as the business interests of letting everyone know that if you come into my shop, you come into my restaurant, you come into my workplace, you will be safe. And that's what we have to overcome is that, that natural instinct towards self-preservation that made people uh, stay home for three solid months to their own detriment. Now they want to come out, but they want to know that all that pain and suffering was not in vain, that they will be protected. So that's why businesses need to go look at what the protocols are required for their specific, specific industry. And again, it's not rocket science. I mean, this is, it's how you're going to socially distance, wearing masks, taking temperatures, you know, keeping a log of people who come in. So if we need a contact tracer, 
to contact everybody in, in con, you know, who was with that individual in the workplace, it's easier to do so. But we also want businesses, and this is so important, they have to certify that they will follow those requirements. And that's where the enforcement mechanism comes in. If someone walks into your business, you need to be able to show uh, your customer, your employees, or someone else who's from the local enforcing agency. And this is being done by the boroughs, the cities, the counties, local governments are in charge of this. You need to show that you certified and that also protects you in terms of liability. You can say, well, I followed everything that the state asked me to do. If there is a spike in your workplace, an employee complains that enough wasn't being done, a customer says, I got sick because you didn't disinfect. You can say, look at, I did exactly as often as the state said I should, I followed this. So, so I wanna make sure that everyone in the state, particularly every business in New York City now has the guidance for phase one and phase two businesses should be looking at that and preparing. And the phase three guidance really came out today. Look at phase three. So this is uh, the, the, the canary in the mine. Uh, we're already testing all this in upstate and I'm managing the largest city outside New York, Buffalo, and it's working right. And I'm pushing businesses to make sure that they adhere to this to protect themselves, the public and their employees. You know, it's a big challenge to recognize that, you know, there are big businesses there are uh, big, bigger, small businesses. A small business is defined as 500 employees or less. There are 30 million small businesses in the United States of America. 84% of them have 20 employees or less. And the large majority of those have four employees or less. So compliance is not easy for everybody, not easy for a mom and pop store, not easy for a smaller business. Uh, it's difficult. Enforcement is very difficult, you know, to follow all these different places to make sure they're following the rules. A lot of it is, is what the governor has been doing, which is cajoling people and, and, and advising them that, listen, you're better off wearing a mask. It's just plain facts as the, as the mask on your face, because you see that uh, uh, first responders, doctors, nurses, people who come into contact the most with people that have the coronavirus have a lower incidence of, of infection than the general public. Why? because they're all wearing masks. They're all wearing gloves, they're all following the rules. So it's just common sense for everybody. And you can't get everybody to comply perfectly. You can't get enforcement on everybody. We need to encourage people that it's just better for you and for all of us if you play it safe and wear a mask. It's not that big a deal. Have fun with it, wear a fun mask if you want, whatever you wanna do, but just wear a mask, it's just, it's, it's a no brainer. So we need to keep on saying that over and over again to people. Oh, I'm not going to wear a mask. You know, I'm, I don't care about it. Well, we care about it. And so just use your brain and, and, and wear a mask. Jessica, anything to add? You know, I think one of the important things is really people, you know, are fatigued with staying home and not socializing and not going out. And I think it's important to educate you know, and reach everybody. And not everybody can be reached through a, a webinar like this. Getting out, and I think the governor's office has done an amazing job on social media, reaching people that otherwise wouldn't be reached. And convincing each person, you have to do your part. If you wanna be able to go out, if we wanna resume a normal life, everyone has to do their part. And that means wearing a mask. That means washing your hands. That means staying six feet away. That means following the rules. And so, as much as the government could do, you know, enforcement, I think a lot of it is education and convincing people that if they want to achieve the result of going back to normal, they're in control. We are all in control and everybody can do their part, you know, both in the way they conduct themselves and also the example they set for other people. Uh, business owners can ensure that everybody coming in is complying. Business owners can ensure that, that you know, people who are, uh, hanging out around their facility are also complying. And everybody has a voice. Everybody can say something and encourage a best practice. And that's really what we need to do um, in order to move forward. Sure. And uh, just a note for the audience, we'll go to audience questions in, in a few minutes. Um, in that Q&A function, should you want to, you can give a thumbs up to any question you like. That'll move it up to the top of the list to give it a little more greater consideration. Uh, and again, if you have any questions you've put in the chat room, please do add those uh, over to the Q&A list and we'll take a look at those momentarily. Um, th there's been um, some mention during this discussion about the risk of a second wave um, and it's a very real risk. 
uh, from what we read from the experts. And I guess two things there. Um, are there like benchmarks for reclosing? Should we, should we come to that point? There are all these benchmarks you have to hit. You can open this region. You can open that region. Are there benchmarks in place? Uh, and then, and then. Secondly, how well prepared are we? Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough PPP on hand? Uh, should there be another major spike in New York? And, I would uh, say we would never be caught off guard the way we were uh, before because first of all, uh, we didn't have the CDC and the federal government letting us know how serious this was. Uh, we were told it's coming in from China. It turned out we were getting infected from a lot of people from Europe. That wasn't established till later, so we couldn't protect our flank in the terms of people coming off of airports and into our street, city streets and our hotels. So we, that will never happen again. And in terms of what we had to do, scouring every corner of this planet in search of ventilators and gowns and masks, I mean, we'll never be that vulnerable again because we're now manufacturing much of that in the state of New York. There's been uh, innovative ways to come up with ventilator type uh, machines if necessary, but you know, a lot of our businesses in New York City, you know, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard have you know, transitioned from manufacturing women's clothing to making masks and gowns. So, so we're better, far better off in terms of readiness with respect to that. Also, we know how to scale up our hospitals. I mean, to go from having 50,000 hospital beds available in the state of New York to prepare for an onslaught of 140,000, which is what the experts were telling us we would need, we knew how to do that. It was painful. It took a, a whole rethinking of our hospital system, collaboration, where there had been none before. So I think our response would be better. And now we have the numbers to know what to look at. And the information that was so wrong before, it only hit seniors, it doesn't hit kids, it can only you know, spread on surfaces. You know, people weren't even talking about masks in early March back then. So if it comes back, and again, this is something the experts expect to happen, New Yorkers can turn on a dime. I mean, we'll be ready for it, we'll see the signs coming, but also if we start seeing the numbers in a control room, start trending with the rate of transmission going upward and hospital beds starting to be filled up again, uh, with the contact tracers, which we now have an army of in the state, we can identify, is this a particular hotspot related to a business or a protest or some family gathering? Is that why the numbers are up with this group here? Or is it something where there's now community spread? And so we're going to have a lot more data to be able to analyze this. We have no desire to ever put New Yorkers through what they just endured. This is something that New Yorkers and Americans will be talking about for the rest of their lives, how they had to endure this. And so we now have so much more information at our disposal. We'll be able to slow down what we're doing, ask people, we can show them the numbers. If the governor has to show up in August or September and say, look, New Yorkers, the numbers are going up. I need you to stay home now. You need to do this. We need this to scale back somewhat. I don't think we'll ever have that wholesale closure that we had to deal with before because uh, we know how to handle this now. Sure, and Congressman, following up on that, um, to what degree do you think this issue has become a partisan issue? That, that you know, some people may look at you and Lieutenant Governor and say, well, well you guys are Democrats and I'm not gonna listen to what you have to say. Um, to what degree has that altered the equation here? You know, in the beginning of the, first of all, I, I've, I'm always working on trying to work across party lines. I'm the vice chairman of a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus, 25 Democrats, 25 Republicans. We meet on a regular basis. Uh, we actually drafted a plan for reopening uh, the country and the different steps, the checklist you need to go through. Much of what the state of New York has actually adopted uh, is similar to what we worked on as a bipartisan group. Uh, in the beginning of the coronavirus, I was actually uh, marveling at how much people were working together across party lines to try and address this crisis in common. And a lot of legislation was passed on a bipartisan basis. And then I can't remember the, the, the turning point, but when uh, the whole thing started with the president encouraging the people with the masks and guns at state capitals to protest that, you know, you have, you have to reopen now, you have to reopen now, I started to see the worm turn. And it started to become much more of a partisan issue uh, between uh, those folks who are saying, reopen right away, reopen right away, you know, we don't care. And other people saying, you know, hey, yeah, we want to reopen, but we got to look at the data. So, and we've seen the consequences of that in states that reopened quickly and are now seeing a spike in their cases. Actually, New York is actually, you know, going down so dramatically 
and some places are still going up in their number of cases because they didn't manage it smartly the way New York did. So it's become more partisan. Uh, I think the president, quite frankly, tr is, exacerbates that. He always throws fuel on the fire whenever there's a division. Uh, and I think a big impact will be what happens with the HEROES bill that the Democrats put out from the House. You know, when the Senate put out their bill and the, 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 the Democrats did not sign on to it right away, people said, hey, Nancy Pelosi, how come you're not negotiating? You got to get a deal done. What are you being so partisan for? So now people are starting to say, hey, Mitch McConnell, what are you being so partisan for? Our states and our local governments, uh, a lot of folks are suffering because you won't come to the table and make a deal. I think what happens with the, with the next negotiation, especially for state and local governments, is going to be crucial to tamping down the partisanship. And then how uh, Republicans decide and Democrats decide how we're going to try and find common ground in response to the murder of George Floyd will also have a big impact on the partisan nature. Now, it's an election year. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I would have said there's no possibility whatsoever we're going to make a deal on infrastructure. No possible, never going to happen. Nobody wants to pay for it. It's not going to happen. I actually believe we could make a deal on infrastructure going forward because we need the stimulus so badly. And so many people want to see, people have always wanted to see infrastructure. They just didn't want to pay for it. So now you have low interest rates. You have a dire need to stimulate the economy. And you have the long standing uh, emergency need, quite frankly, to invest in infrastructure. So those three things, state and local governments getting money, the response to the George Floyd merge, murder and the infrastructure bill are three things that will really set the tone over the next 30 days, really, as to whether or not the, we're going to see an acceleration of the partisanship or a tamping down of it at the legislative level. Trini, you mentioned I politics intervened when uh, Mitch McConnell said no bailouts for blue states. I mean, that was the day when it was so clear to us that this spirit of uh, America coming together was going to now devolve into Democrats versus Republicans. And we have said all along, uh, this virus does not single out people of one political party or another. And that was a very dark day for our country to know that there was even that thought that all of us are literally just hanging on for dear life and people are struggling and losing their jobs and trying to collect unemployment. And you talk about politics, this was wrong, but our job is to put that aside. I can't control what they do in Washington. I served in Congress, and I'm really happy to be working in an administration that is focused on reopening our economy. And that's what I want to talk about today is how we can you know, ignite this economy once again and to reimagine the COVID crisis pandemic or world of New York where we're doing things smarter. We're using the technology that's been there all along, but we never embraced it. So people like women who have children can have more flexibility and work at home. How we can use teleeducation to right some of the wrongs and the disparities, as long as we have enough broadband and, and telehealth services to make people healthier in the long run. We have so much we can do here. We are not paying attention to what goes on in Washington because if our destiny was linked to what goes on there, we'd be in much more trouble as New Yorkers and that's where we're heading. And uh, you mentioned the, the death of uh, George Floyd, Congressman. Um, race has been an issue here, just with the disparities in who is getting infected with coronavirus. Uh, and then obviously uh, the death of George Floyd uh, really inflamed tensions, led to major, you know, unprecedented protests in, in my lifetime at least. Um, I guess just to hit on that, uh, what can we do to help heavily minority communities. There's, there's been attention to not just police behavior and, and the, the healthcare question, but broader racial disparities. Um, I guess on, in terms of reopening and the economy, uh, what can be done, what will be done going forward? Well, there's no question that systemic racism is a reality, that there are terrible, tragic uh, inequities that exist, not only related to criminal justice, but related to housing and education and to healthcare. And uh, when it comes to reopening the economy related to minority communities, one of the really important things that happened was that uh, Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez, who's the chairwoman of the Small Business uh, Committee in Congress, fought along with many of us uh, to make sure that the second round of the PPP loans, the, the payroll protection program loans, actually a big piece of it was given to minority-owned banks. A big piece was given to community banks. A big piece was given to credit unions. 
so that not only could we try and drive more of these loans to smaller small businesses, I talked earlier about how 84% of small businesses in America have less than 20 employees, not only smaller small businesses, uh, but uh, minority women owned businesses as well. And we need to be focusing in everything that we do, quite frankly, whether it's a, an infrastructure bill, whether it's testing related to the HEROES Act, whether it's money to state and local governments, uh, whether it's uh, any type of thing that we work on, I think that it's essential going forward uh, that we start thinking about what's the impact going to be on persons of color. I think that, you know, after years of, you know, a, an event and then it dies down, an event that it dies down, an event that it dies down, I think that the, the, the public is activated right now to really want to see hap something happen regarding the racial inequities in America. And the only way that's going to happen is by keeping that issue in our minds whenever we're addressing any issue. And so whether it's education, housing, healthcare, you know, healthcare, it's so important that we have more people of color as doctors, more pe people of color that are uh, healthcare professionals, nurses, uh, scientists. Uh, so there's just so much we have to do, uh, but I think that this is the time that it can possibly happen. Just uh, one question. We had a few audience questions. Um, one of them, Bradley, some set up here. How will the city address transportation challenges or, or what do we do with transit going forward? If, if one of you may wants to touch on that. Well, we've already met that challenge. I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of people are now getting back to work on uh, heavily sterilized, safe and, uh, trains and subways throughout the metropolitan area. So we, this was the way we're doing it. If you do it in a phased in approach, I mean, this is the first step, the baby steps, if you will, construction, manufacturing, uh, some limited retail. This is going to give us the opportunity to test how it's all working, add more trains, add more capacity, give people that comfort level that they're going to be okay if they venture out of their homes to go to their workplace. And then by the time we get to phase two, we start introducing more people, you start getting a higher level of comfort. But this is something that we've been addressing from the very beginning, knowing that our economy only comes back when we bring back public transportation, that the buses, the trains, and the subways are clean, they're ready, and they're gonna be there to tra start transporting people. But everyone realizes this is not New York City back to normal today. This is phase one of a series of phases that'll gradually open up the spigot to allow more people out into the workplace. And, and that's that phase approach that's gonna be much safer and allow us to manage the transportation as well. I think when it comes to transportation, it's all about building this confidence, again, with the testing and the data. And I think a lot of people will continue to telecommute if they can. I think that a lot of people will uh, not take the train into the city. They'll, I'm talking about from Long Island or east of the northeastern Queens, but people will take the, uh, uh, their cars when possible. Uh, and it will happen naturally, I think, that people will not start using the trains to, and the subways to the point where they're packed until there's a sense of confidence that they're not going to be exposing themselves to a tremendous risk. And that's why the data, the testing is so important. Sure. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time. I'd like to say thanks again to our sponsors, the Parkside Group, Jasper Schlesinger LLP, and our healthcare partner on the Summit Affinity Health Plan. With the unprecedented job loss due to the current health crisis, Affinity Health Plan is here as a resource to help, help educate the thousands of New Yorkers affected about the health coverage options available to them. A final note, we'll be holding an additional discussion in our series next week on Tuesday, June 16th on transit. We'll have New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, the city's transportation commissioner, Polly Trottenberg, and the Long Island Railroad President, Philip Eng. Uh, mm -hmm. Registration can be found on our website. Thank you to our audience for turning in. And of course, thank you to all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, John. Thank you. And that concludes our program.